Well, this morning we are going to go back into the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12. Uh, A couple of weeks ago we started here with Romans 12 verse 1, and we'll review a little bit this morning to kind of refresh our memories. Uh, But let's go ahead this morning and we'll read Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This morning, as we are now coming into the study of God's word, let's go ahead and close our eyes and let's pray together once more, asking the Lord to help us to understand his word and to take it to heart and to live it out every day. Heavenly Father, uh, now as we turn our attention to what your word has to say this morning, we ask that it would just be clear to us today that we as your people would, would very clearly see and understand your intentions for us in this passage, that we would take it seriously, that we would take it to heart, that, Lord, the, the desire of our heart would be to be obedient to what we find in your word, that we would not be guilty of just hearing it and then going our separate ways when the service is concluded and not living it out, but, Lord, that we would be hearers of your word and also doers of your word so that we can be pleasing and glorifying to you, so that we can be uh, of service to you, so that we can, uh, Lord, just in this world around us, be a light and a witness and a testimony for the truth and the power of the gospel. We pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, a few weeks ago, we looked at the introduction to the book of Romans. We looked at Romans chapter 1 and the way the Apostle Paul opens things up here. And in chapter 1, he is writing of the gospel of God. That's what we find in Romans chapter 1, verse number 1. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. And in verse 3, we see what that is. The gospel of God, the good news being proclaimed is that it's concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So a few weeks ago, as we began wading into the book of Romans, what we saw very clearly is that the the emphasis or the theme that's being presented to us here is about the gospel, the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is. And right here in these very first three verses, the opening of the book of Romans, it's proclaimed to us that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means that he is the one with all the rights. He is the one with all the authorities. He is the highest power. There is no one that can overpower or overrule him. That's who he is. He is Christ the Lord. But it also says here, it says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So we also saw a few weeks ago that Jesus Christ, the eternal son of God, became man. He came to us. He became one of us. He was born of a woman, born of the the seed or the line or the lineage of David, and that's how he came. Now, coming in that way, it didn't diminish the fact that he is God in the flesh, because that's who he is, and that's what the resurrection proves to us. That's what it says here in verse 4. It says, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead that the resurrection proves that what Jesus said about himself, what Jesus demonstrated about himself, it proved that all of it was true. And if you remember, we kind of looked at a courtroom situation, that the person stands in court and they proclaim themselves, most of the time, they proclaim themselves to be innocent. They say they are not guilty of the crimes they're being accused of. And over the course of that trial, the evidence is presented that proves whether they're telling Telling the truth or not. Well, when it says that the resurrection does that about the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't suddenly become the Son of God with power at his resurrection. He always was. He always asserted that. He he said that very plainly on several different occasions. And the resurrection proves that what he said about himself and what he demonstrated about himself is true. And so here in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul is, is setting this up that this is something we need to grab onto and take hold of. The gospel is essential. 
And the first 11 chapters of Romans are all about the gospel. In fact, here in Romans chapter 1, where we just were, there's a key verse to the whole book. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so for the first 11 chapters of this book, he is setting up the fact that all of mankind has a problem called sin. And because man has a sin problem, that means that man has a problem with God and God has a problem with man because God has no sin and God can't stand sin. But God is loving and God is good and God is gracious and God is wise. And God in his wisdom and in his mercy and in his grace gives us the way of salvation. It's the way that he planned, the way that he prepared, and the way that he presents to all the world. And we know that people of every tribe and tongue and nation, men and women, every person, people of all kinds, can be saved by this gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And at the end of chapter 11, at verse number 32, there's kind of this, this, we see a transition coming into being as we move into chapter 12. In verse number 32 of Romans chapter 11, it says, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. The idea here is that the gospel is there. Present the gospel to everyone. Everyone needs the gospel. Look at verse number 33 with me. Because as we're making this transition into what we look at as chapter 12, we now have this kind of beautiful uh, doxology, this kind of song of praise and worship to the Lord. And look what it says. Read these words along with me in Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Read the, as, as I'm reading them, you pay attention and, and read them for yourself. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Here in this song of worship and praise to God, we see that he is wise. We see that he is just. We see that he knows all. He doesn't need counsel from anyone. He doesn't owe anyone anything. Because, again, look at verse 36 with me. Look what it says. It says, For of him and through him and to him are all things, and so to him belong glory forever. And then it ends there with the word, Amen. Now, amen is a word that means surely and certainly. It's a word that means that what he's writing, what he's expressing, when he seals it with an amen, it says that, that, it, that this is an expression of absolute trust and confidence. I fully believe that this is who God is. I am confident that this is his plan. I am confident and assured, and assured of all of these things about our God. And then we move into chapter 12. Moving forward with this confidence of who God is, of the gospel that is presented throughout the first 11 chapters. And so now this transition that takes place in the book is, now, what is going to be your response, Christian, to the gospel that has had the power to transform your life? Not just your eternal life, but the power to transform your life right here and right now. And the language that he uses... He says, I beseech you, now we're in chapter 12, verse number 1. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And the word beseech, we looked at this, I think, uh, two weeks ago now, is the idea that he is coming alongside us and he's encouraging us to do something. He's coming alongside and he is, he, is, he is in every way possible doing his best to let us know that this is what we need to do. 
He's encouraging. He's imploring. He's begging. He's pleading. He's saying this should be the natural response of your heart when you consider the gospel, when you consider the goodness of God, when you consider what he's done in your life. This is what your response should be. He says, I beseech you by the mercies of God that he's just spent 11 chapters and especially the last few verses describing that you do something that you worship God in a certain way. He says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That now, in response to what Jesus has done, understanding that Jesus is the sacrifice that we all needed, knowing that I don't need to bring lambs and whatever else to present sacrifices anymore, what do we do? This changes the worship system, doesn't it? What must we do now? He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, do this. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. That now, in light of what Christ has done, and the gospel that we have received, and the changes that it's making in our lives, what we need to do is we need to live differently. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That now our expression of worship is to offer ourselves to him. That we are willing, we're ready, we're available. We are a lively sacrifice, putting our energies into it. Uh, I remember a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at this verse that I, I kind of made the, the, the connection that, you know, there are different stages in life, aren't there? You know, there are, like, I watch my children, and my goodness, I, they're, they're four and seven. I, yeah, yeah, four and seven. That's how old my children are. And I'm here 41. And can I tell you, there is an energy disparity there. Um, I, I understand now, like, <laughs> no, I'm going to take that back and I'm going to say this a different way. Like, I, I, under, mm, I understand now why it's so easy for them to get on my nerves. I love them dearly, don't mishear me. But they are always moving. They are always doing something. They are always up and around. <laughs> Liam's back there shaking his head. Yes, he sees that it's school. They are always up and running around and doing something. And I am at the point in my life where I am 41 years old, and I'm still up and around and moving, but not with that kind of energy. <laughs> and they're hard to keep up with. And they're hard to, they're hard, they're, they're off running around. You see it here every Sunday afternoon, running all over the place. And I'm doing my best to keep up with them and to watch what they're doing and make sure they're not getting into trouble. And I fail utterly. Why? Because I don't have that kind of energy. Now, there are people in this room that are looking at me and saying, you're only 41. <laughs> Mrs. Smith just verbally said, exactly. What are you complaining about? Jay's over here saying, wait 10 years. <laughs> All right. So we're seeing that there are differences in phases and stages of life. I was a hospice chaplain. I've been there as people receive their terminal diagnosis. I've been there as their, their, their livelihood begins to really wane and, and go to that place where they are ready to go and meet their maker. See, there are different, way, there are different types of living. And the picture that's being given to us here is that in light of all that God has done and in light of the goodness that he has bestowed upon us through his grace, through the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation, that we should worship him by giving ourselves to him as a living or lively sacrifice. That means that as we worship him in this way with our lives, we don't just sit there and say, okay, Lord, yep, whatever you need. Here I am. No, it's a life of activity. It's a life of actively serving the Lord. And in this verse, in verse number one, it says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. That is three things. A living sacrifice that is holy. Meaning a sacrifice that is set apart to him alone. Remember Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. 
So we are a holy sacrifice set apart from the, the sins of this world, set apart from the things this world has to offer. We are dedicated to him and to his service and to his glory. Then it says, acceptable. And the idea of acceptable is the idea that we are well-pleasing to him. In other words, that as we give ourselves and give our energies to him, as we worship him by placing ourselves at his disposal, that the things that we're doing and the way that we're doing it, it's pleasing him. He's looking at what we're doing. He's seeing what we're doing. He's the one that's giving us the things to do. We're obeying, we're following, we're doing what he's given us, and he is well pleased by that. But then it says reasonable. And there's some deep meaning here. Because the word reasonable, it's the idea of being logical. It's the idea of exercising our mind in a decision that we're making. And so as the Apostle Paul is writing and saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. He's saying this is a decision. Doing this is something that's going to originate from inside you. It's going to be something that happens because you not only see that it's logical that I should do this, but we're going to have to train our minds and focus our minds on something if we're going to do it in a way that is set apart unto the Lord and in a way that is going to be pleasing to him. And so he brings us right into verse number two with this idea of, 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 of using logic, of using our minds, of, of exercising our minds in the way that we give ourselves to God. Because giving ourselves to God in this way is very definitely a choice. And I'll tell you, friends, it's not just a choice that you made a year ago, or five years ago, or ten years ago. It's a choice we make every day. And it's a choice we make often throughout the day. And we're led right into verse 2, where we're told this. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So now verse number two here, it begins with the word and. It's a conjunction drawing us back into something. It's bringing us back into the Apostle Paul opening this chapter and saying, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. He's saying, I beseech you, brethren, by these to do these two things, to present yourself to God in this way, worship him by giving yourself to him a lively sacrifice set apart to him, using your, you know, serving from the mind, serving with your life, and also I beseech you you, don't be conformed to this world. So here again, he's putting his arm around us and encouraging and begging and pleading and saying, have a mind that is focused on worshiping God, of living a life that serves him, instead of one that's focused on looking like the world. See, the word conformed, here, here is what it means. The word conformed means to fashion oneself in mind and character to another's pattern. Let me read that again. That was a whole bunch of words, and I want to make sure we all hear it and understand it. To fashion oneself in mind and character to another's pattern. Now, when I was a kid, I used to watch my grandma Dodson, who was very handy with a needle and thread and sewing machine. And very often the clothes that she was wearing were things that she made herself. And I remember watching as she would go to the table and she would lay out the fabric that she was going to use to make whatever it is that she was making. And she would pull out that pattern that she was going to use to make the dress or whatever she was going to make. And she would pull out that pattern and she would lay that pattern out on that fabric and she would trace lines and she would cut lines and she would pin things and she would put it all together. And by the time she was done, that thing that she was making would look like it was supposed to look based on the pattern that she was following. That's the picture that we have here. It's the picture of you and being the person that God has made you to be, but instead of conforming to Christ and following his pattern, 
It's the idea of conforming ourselves after a different pattern. A pattern that we shouldn't be paying attention to. Because here's the truth. What we think about, we become. We move toward whatever our attention is focused on. If you're driving down the road and you're watching the road and you're watching those lines, what do you do? You stay in the lines, you stay where you belong. But if you start looking at something over here, what naturally begins to happen? You begin to drift. You're going where your focus is going. Same thing happens when I'm mowing the lawn. And good times, it's lawn mowing season. When I'm mowing my, like, however many acres of yard it is, because my grandfather retired and got a riding lawnmower. And so over the course of a couple of decades, our lawn went from this big to this big to this big to this big as he mowed more and more field into subjection and made it lawn. Thank you, Grandpa. Anyway, I have all this lawn. I know that when I get on that riding lawnmower, that I sit there and I'm paying attention to a couple of things. I'm paying attention to what my grandfather told me to pay attention to. I'm paying attention to the little guide wheel that's there on the mower deck. I want to see that that wheel is over in the last line, the last strip that I just mowed. I want to pay attention to my lines and where they are. So that way I'm mowing, and when I'm mowing, I'm going to mow everything I need to mow. Because there is nothing... Okay, there are probably other things that are more infuriating than this. But one of the things that can really infuriate you is to go ahead and mow your lawn and think you're done and look back and realize that you missed places. Well, why did I miss places? Because I took my focus off of where my focus needed to be. I got distracted. I didn't pay attention to what I was supposed to be paying attention to. And what do you have to do? You go back and you do it over again. Just this past week, I mowed the church lawn. And the very next day, Albert was here. And he said to me, what'd you do, run when you were mowing this? Because by the time we got to it, it was a couple weeks overdue. And I was moving quick. I wanted to get that job done. So many of the departments, rather than being hacked up like they should be, were just knocked over. And so the next day, when you looked at it, they all went, Whoop, and they were back up again. Here's the picture that we're seeing. Be not conformed to this world. See, we're already being brought into this verse with the idea of using our minds to make a decision to serve the Lord. Using our minds, and what are our minds being focused on? Our minds should not be, must not be focused on the things of the world and the times in which we live. If our minds are focused on the amusements and the fashions and the lifestyles and the things that are popular, then what's going to happen? We're going to reflect all of those things in our lives. And that's not the life that we as Christians are called to live. So instead, we need to be determined to worship the Lord by being that lively and holy sacrifice, that sacrifice that's given to him by focusing our minds on the things of him. So instead of focusing our minds on what the world finds entertaining or popular or acceptable, uh, that's all going to hinder us. What we need to do is focus our minds on something else. If we focus on the pattern of the world, we will be like the world. But instead of being conformed to that pattern, we have to be something. Look what it says. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now the word transformed here is a pretty interesting word. And I want to take a look at it. Because the only, there are only four places that we find this exact usage of the word in our New Testaments. And we're going to look at them. So save your place here in Romans chapter 12. But go with me back to the gospel records, back to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 17. And verse number one. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, 
and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. So here we are at the transfiguration, and the word transfigured is the same as the word transformed that we find in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 2. Now fast forward to the book of Mark. We're in the same, the same idea, same thing going on here in the way that Mark is recording it. Mark chapter 9 and verse number 2. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into an high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. The third place we find it is in Romans chapter 12, verse number 2 that we've already read. The fourth place that we find it is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians three and verse 18. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So there where, the, where you see the word changed talking about what we will be one day when we are with him as he is. That's the same as the word transfigured or transformed that we find here in Romans chapter 12. So the places that we find this word being used in our Bible, it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ when his divine nature was outwardly visible. In 2 Corinthians, it's talking about the time that will come in the future when our outside also reflects what God has put into us. And so the idea that we're finding here is that we are not to be patterned after the world, focusing our attention on the things of the world, naturally tending towards looking like the world, but rather what we're supposed to be doing is the mind inside of us. It says, by the, uh, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that what God is putting on the inside of us needs to be working its way out of us in the way that we are serving the Lord. That what, becomes, that what we become known for, what we become seen as, is not what we used to be when we were of the world, because as Christians, we are no longer of the world. That now what's seen in us are the things that are godly. And that starts in our minds. It starts with our thinking patterns. It starts with what we are going to willingly direct our attention and our focus to. Because it says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I know that on this side of heaven, we can't have a body that's free from sin or free from its effects. We're going to have sickness and all those things. We understand that. But we can still have a life that reflects what God has given us by his goodness, by his mercy, by his grace in salvation. And that's through the renewing of our mind. And the word renewing here, it's the idea of renovating and completely changing. Have you ever, do you ever watch like HGTV? And you see them buying like these disaster old houses and completely renovating them and taking out walls and putting in new beams and, you know, taking that cramped little 1950s floor pattern and making an open floor. Like they take that house and by the time they're done with it, you don't even recognize it anymore. It looks different. Well, that's the idea here. It's be not conformed to this world, but be transformed or transfigured, seen differently by the renewing of your mind. In other words, the, 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 the things that we are focusing on, that instead of exploring what the world gives, what we're doing instead is we are exploring what God has given us and digging into that. And that's what it says as we move on. By the renewing of your mind, that ye may do what? That ye may prove. And the word prove, it means to test or to examine, to determine what is genuine. So now, here's something that we need to understand. Everything the world has to offer, is it real or is it fake? 
This is not a hard question. Someone should know the answer to this. What the world has to offer, all the pretty shiny things, the fame, the fortune, all that stuff, is it real or is it fake? It's all fake. Not a thing there that will last. It's all, it all gets rusty. It all falls apart. None of it produces real joy. None of it gives any lasting peace. Can you think, I, I know that right now I can think of several people. In fact, most recent that I'm aware of, Naomi Judd. What a sad, committed suicide, shot herself the day before she was supposed to receive a major award. Someone that has experienced fame, fortune, but it wasn't worth it. It didn't do anything to change her life. It didn't give her peace, joy, security, love. So we're supposed to be proving, testing, or examining to determine what is genuine. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So here's what these verses are telling us. That we as believers, as an act of worship, need to give ourselves to God and be at his disposal. Serving him in a lively way, giving him our energies, saying, Lord, here I am in everything that I've got, and I want to do whatever you want me to do. There are clearly things that we know as believers we all should do. We all should have an emphasis in our lives where we find the emphasis in the book of Romans, and that is there should be a gospel emphasis in all of our lives. There should be an emphasis in living it out. There should be an emphasis in sharing it. There should be an emphasis in taking that gospel to those that are around us. There are other things that God has given you and given me that, our, that are our gifts specifically. I cannot play the piano like Mrs. Smith can, and Mrs. Smith can't play the piano like I can. Because <laughs> she likes it to be good. <laughs> But we all have things that God has given us. And so rather than living a life where we are exploring and taking in all of the things that are fake about the world around us, instead of living for all of those things, instead of wanting to be popular, or instead of wanting to have wealth, instead of all of that stuff. Now, is there anything wrong with having money? No, and I'm grateful for everyone that does. But there's a big problem if the wealth has you. And see, that's the difference. We could talk about the testimonies of people like, um, oh, Katie, help me, uh, Alcoa, um, Alcoa Building Products. Um, oh, now you're looking at me like, okay. Um, Katie, don't help me. Um, Alcoa Building Products. This is, I think it's R.G. Letourneau. Yes. Who... God blessed. And he said, you know what? I'm going to prove the Lord. And you know what he did? He started giving and being generous. And he found that as he was giving and being generous, God blessed him. Because God knew he wasn't going to be someone that was going to hoard it to himself and keep it all. Instead, he was going to be someone that gave. And so God kept giving to him. J.C. Penney is another one. You can look at Wanamaker in Philadelphia. There are all kinds of people that have said, you know what, the talents that I have, the abilities that I have, I'm going to, oh, who's the guy that was determined to make as much money as he possibly could? He thought that it was God, like, the, the, since God gave him the ability to make money, he better make it. 
It might be a bad example. But anyway. But there are plenty of things named after them that they did in their community. But anyway, I digress. But determine that with whatever, if it's a talent for business, if it's a talent for piano, if it's a talent for cleaning, if it's a talent for whatever it is, it's not how can I use this for me to make me, it's how can I use this for God? How can I use this for those that are around me? Because as we read this verse, we see it's the renewing of your minds that you may prove three things. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? And I think that in those three words, good, acceptable, and perfect, we have summarized what it means to be faithful. Here's why. The word good simply means useful. If you have stuff around your house and it's not useful anymore, what is it? It's not good. What do we do? Chuck it. It's not useful to us anymore. That's the idea that we find here. Prove what is that good. What is useful? How is it that God can use us? What are the things that, what is useful in serving him? And the next one is acceptable, which again, like we, like we saw a minute ago, that, you know, the idea of that living sacrifice that is acceptable to the Lord, it's the idea of being well-pleasing to him. So the idea here is that the transformed mind, the, the transfiguring of the way we're going to live, the pattern that we're going to follow after is one that is about how can I serve the Lord and please him? How can I be of use? How can I serve him in a way that pleases him? And then it's also the idea of the perfect will of God. And the word perfect means complete. Meaning that whatever it is that we put our hands to for the glory of God, we're going to follow through and finish up. That's what we saw back in Isaiah with the idea of the Lord's servant, that he was faithful to do exactly what he was given to do. He didn't quit partway through. He didn't get to the hard parts and say, you know what, forget it, it's not worth it. No, that's not the way we serve the Lord. We give ourselves to him as an act of worship, and we say, here I am, I am yours. Do with me as you see fit. Use me in however it's going to honor and glorify you. Let me, what are the gifts that you have given me? How can I take these things? How can I use them for your honor and your glory? Not trying to be popular in the world's eyes, not trying to conform to the world's ideals, but conforming only to the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ, wanting only to please the one who gave us the gifts in the first place. And we set our minds there. We set our minds to proving. How can I be useful and pleasing? And what are the things that I can do to completion and be faithful for the one who has been faithful to me? For the one who didn't quit on me? For the one that has a hold of me and will never let me go? How can I be faithful to him? We are available for his use. We want to be pleasing for his service. We want to be faithful to carry all the way to the end what he has given us to do. So the response as believers in light of the goodness and mercy of God, in light of the power of the gospel and what it has done in our own lives, our response is that we are going to explore the gifts he's given us and seek to please him with those gifts. Determined to focus our attention there, determined to finish whatever he gives us to do for his honor and for his glory. Because we've given ourselves to him. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we think about what we read here in these two verses, there are some serious things for us to consider. Because here in this world that we live in, there are so many things that look so good. But we have to, in our minds, 
in our renewed, our regenerated minds, we have to understand that all of those things that look so good, they are not genuine. They don't produce anything that lasts. They don't produce anything that matters. But giving ourselves to you, giving ourselves to you with our energy, giving ourselves to you, focusing our mind on what you want us to do, on the gifts that you have given us to serve you with, focusing ourselves on, on, on what is useful for your purposes, what is acceptable and pleasing to you, and what is going to be something that, that by your grace we will complete and see through to the end. Help us to keep our minds there so that our focus is where it needs to be, so that the, the lives that we're living are lives that are reflective of what you have done in us. Help us to be Christians with that kind of desire in our heart and that kind of testimony that's visible to the world around us. So that, Lord, we can be bringing honor and glory, glory to you in the way we live, the things we do well-pleasing to you.